welcome once again to The Web Show. This is such an exciting episode. Meg had to join us today. Coming in. It's been a while since we've seen you folks, isn't it? A little while. Two pretty exciting reasons that this show is pretty epic. First of all, our guest. I mean. Really cool. Oh, love the film. Obviously, you know from the thumbnail and the opening that Never Ending Story, Tammy Stronach was so kind enough to chat to me for this episode. We met her in Liverpool before lockdown. Lovely lady, super cool. All girls wanted to be her, I think. Uh, that is true. You wanted but to be in the Never Ending Story? You wanted to be there? I did. Little angelic face on I you. I wanted to be in it so bad. I, I did my textile dress in high school based around the headpiece for Childlike Empress. So anyway, long story. Um, another reason this show is so exciting, because... Mm -hmm. and bum, bum, bum. And stay to the end, because we are going to be giving away a copy. Our <sighs> film is out. Number two in the Life After series, and getting some stellar reviews, I might add. Really great reviews. It's really exciting. It is shipping now. <laughs> buy this, buy this. But please buy this. <laughs> Uh, lifeaftermovies.com region flea <laughs> region flea again region free blu-ray we'll we'll talk more about it at the end of the episode because we are going to give away not only a blu-ray signed by joey <gasps> what signed, else? signed by joey and i'm trying to rank and a crew patch who wants to become part of our life after the navigator crew huh former q people <laughs> Form a cue. But we'll stop talking about Life After the Navigator because there'll be more about it at the end of the episode because everyone will be like, stop talking about the And you're going to be staying till the end of the episode, aren't you? Oh, you to will. win this. So don't go anywhere. Yes, but we know why everyone is really here and that is to watch the absolutely amazing Tammy Stronach. So without further ado, Tammy Stronach. Today's web show, I am so, so excited. Grew up with this film, grew up wanting to be this woman, still do, um, beautiful then, stunning now. Um, Tammy Stronach, welcome to the web show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are in Scotland and you do have a bit of a tartan backdrop, which is very fitting. So first of all, how is lockdown in Scotland treating you? Well, actually, um... I'm very fortunate in that I'm in uh, Moray. I'm in a sort of part of Scotland that's the lowest tier of lockdown. So it's a uh, tier one. Um, and I'm in this very beautiful uh, part of Scotland. It's called Finhorn, right by the water. And so I really can't complain. Scotland is so beautiful. And if you're going to be in a pandemic, being here by the water is not a bad place to to be in a pandemic. <laughs> now, correct me if I get any of these facts wrong, because I always, you know, pinch of salt what I read on, on the internet, but you, your father was Scottish, so you have a Scottish connection? Yeah, it's, it's strange. I feel this like pull back to Scotland right now. Um, my father was Scottish and he went to school here as a boy and told me all these stories about uh, going to school here. It's a school called Gordonston. I sort of heard about it growing up and the founder of it was a German educator named Kurt Hahn who created Outward Bound. He had to escape the Nazis in Germany and it was this uh, kind of massive fleeing and he reestablished the school in Scotland really with this idea of um, educating people to have um, a kind of international perspective and uh, an appreciation for diversity and um, and then also included in that a real appreciation for nature and so it was sort of a radical approach to education he really wanted kids to be outside in nature hiking sailing camping um, and my daughter had been in lockdown in New York for so long and then online learning and this 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 idea of like her in the forest like digging and climbing trees just like oh I just like I was just like how can I get her there and then when the film started thinking about moving locations and we we thought maybe we could move work over to Scotland I just seized on this opportunity and it's just super surreal my daughter is going to the same school my 
father went to, and it's this lovely, sweet, familial tradition. I, it's kind of, I'm, I'm sort of shocked that it happened. I learned from my father that that is where he studied Shakespeare and he acted in all these plays. And it's just interesting kind of revisiting your family history from an adult perspective, because suddenly you start to make connections to who you are and the ways in which you mirrored your parents without really realizing it. My father was an archeologist and just never really thought about the fact that he spent so much of his youth doing Shakespeare here in castles in Scotland. You know? <laughs> and like, no wonder I like really mystical, whimsical sets and theater. <laughs> Like it all sort of comes to life in a fresh way when you look at it and you have the opportunity to kind of walk walk through those halls and through that architecture and um, and apparently that was a big passion of my father's and and when he was young and he didn't talk about it a lot he he passed away last year and I would say that the the last year of his life he started reflecting a lot on um, things more from his boyhood and and so uh, I absorbed them and and then they're all sort of kind of weirdly coming to life for my daughter in front of me. It's really a, a strange and uh, kind of wonderful circle. So you mentioned the film being Man and Witch, the reason you're in Scotland. would love to talk to you about that. Um, was, your, was your history with Scotland or your dad a reason why you picked Scotland as the location or was that purely coincidental? Initially, for cost reasons, we thought the best place to do the film would be upstate New York, where I live in New York. I have a house in New York. I have lots of contacts in New York. There's great actors in New York. But then there really aren't a lot of castles in New York. <laughs> And it's just, it's not very old, you know, not really. And so if you're kind of trying to recreate this medieval world, it's pretty, pretty challenging. Uh, and then we heard through a friend, I mean, it's so ha funny how life happens. I think so much of life happens by coincidence. And then you find yourself there and you're like, what is, how did I end up here? <laughs> so a friend of ours, um, who's, who we, met many years ago in a kind of very different part of our, she was my um, tax accountant, went to London, fell in love, started being a tax accountant for films. So it's this whole like, and she called us and she's like, why aren't you doing the film in the UK? There's this great, you know, uh, tax credit that you can get if, if the film can qualify as British. And I am a UK citizen. And actually it's a fantasy film and it has a lot of, of sort of, elements that the, the real world is set in England and then you go into the fantasy world. So it qualified and I don't know, just door after door started opening and then, and then we did the math on it and it was like, well, we really could film this in the UK and they have much better locations. And then, I don't know, I just think I, I kind of like kept pushing it to Scotland. <laughs> wanted to be in Scotland but I don't know yeah the film just called to me that it needs to be in Scotland and so here here we are in a quite surprising turn of events and of course there's lockdown and so many ways in which the film has stalled and so I'm not going to say that you know it was it was all perfect calculations because we left New York where there was raging COVID to come here where there was none. And now of course, England's in a full month lockdown. And so, you know, we're just rolling with the madness of it all, but there's this strange uh, convergence of personal life and the sets for the film. And I don't know, Scotland is very fantastical and magical to me. I, I, I just, feel like there's a lot of just magic in the nature here. It is, there's an amazing energy in Scotland, especially in the Highlands, and it is a very magical place. And I think out of all of the UK, um, from what I understand about Man and Witch, it seems like the perfect location, because it's a throwback to, uh, is this correct, a throwback to kind of the fantasy films of the 80s, and it's it's real magical film. What is the film about? You have an amazing cast, really excited to see it. So it's definitely a throwback to 80s films. Um, we wanted to do things kind of the old fashioned way. I mean, definitely, I'm not going to um, lie. There is a budgetary component, you know, doing things uh, on set in practical locations versus doing them in the studio is cheaper. Doing things with puppets versus CGI is cheaper. But beyond that, there's a kind of... Um, a way in which I spent so much of my life dancing 
and being in the theater. And, and I, I am drawn to being in the environment, feeling the weather, feeling the objects, having them exist. And also even with puppets, there's a human being inside of there, manipulating it, pouring their chi into this object and bringing it to life. And that all, this sort of magic of movement and uh, the flow of energy animating objects feels very related to dance to me. Um, and so these are techniques and, and ways of making things that, that I just love and they're old, they're, they're kind of being phased out. And um, so we, I just wanted to revisit it. It's, it's definitely the, the movies that I grew up with, the world that I grew up with, and the thing that inspired me to become an artist. So I wanted to revisit those tools, those landscapes, um, and uh, kind of being in a practical location. So yeah, so there's all of those different elements. And Manon, which is, is very much uh, kind of like a, it's just, it's, updating it's taking all the things that we love about those fantasy worlds um particularly uh kind of the underdog being the hero and um and sort of us rooting for that i don't know somehow i feel like films just got like the the really cool rich really buff person wins and you're like yay <laughs> i don't know like it's just not that exciting <laughs> Um, I kind of miss those like, you know, is he going to make it? Is it going to happen? You know, So I kind of, I kind of wanted to go back to those storylines and also, um, and also update it. You know, I think a lot of those 80s fantasy films were magical and wonderful and story was front and center. Characters were front and center. The movie making magic really happened through relationship and interaction. And those are things I really love about those kinds of stories. But some of them were really sexist. There were a lot of them where women were just kind of like the eye candy and um, the worlds were not diverse at all. And, you know, living in New York City, you, you want to have worlds where, you know, it's a lot of different kinds of people walking around. Um, you know, we have a problem, which is my husband wrote it and he wrote it for me. So <laughs> our casting in my... It, in my dream life, it would have been more diverse than we're kind of able to under the circumstances, but we still really want that to be an important element. Like we don't, we're, we're really interested in the sort of, the sort of casual visuals alluding to the fact that um, it's, it's a kind of uh, diverse world and, and try to, we haven't cast it fully, but that's definitely something we care about a lot um, is updating that aspect of it. And then also a twist. So I, I don't know, you know, basically usually in, in fantasy films, the guy ends up with the princess. You can think about the title and you can infer who he may end up with. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he, he ends up with, you know, not, not the person that you would necessarily expect a, a much more complicated, much less, a uh, glamorous but more interesting um, figure. I mean, it sounds it's it sounds like the perfect blend of what we need out of films today with the diversity aspect, but just the magic of the '80s and the physical the physicality of puppets and you know that really is missing a, a lot in today's films. And I always feel sad for kids growing up today because it doesn't feel like they have that magic of the films that we grew up in. I feel like the world needs a little bit of magic and it's definitely a feel good film. Like it, it's, it's, it's just a feel good film. It's a film that when, when we hope that if we can do it right, when you walk out, you kind of just believe in love just a little bit more. What's your projected timeline for it? I just don't even know how to do that. You know, given the current situation, we're moving as quickly as we can, our goal is to start shooting uh, really soon in February is our goal to start shooting now. And if everything goes well and holds in sort of the current structure that we have, that'll happen. Uh, but, you know, we're at the mercy of, of, of a pandemic and we, we definitely don't want to put anyone at risk. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, we balance our desire to work and get back to creativity with keeping everyone safe and, so that's obviously the thing that everyone's balancing right now. And, and safety is for sure the highest priority. So we're crossing our fingers. We get 
filming in February. Have to ask you, of course, about Never Ending Story. Uh, you were a huge part of that film. You were a huge part of so many childhoods. Hopefully Man and Witch can be a huge part of kids now and their childhoods. They'll be talking about it in 35, 40 years. Um, did you know at the time Never Ending Story would be so loved all these years later? No, no, not at all. I, I don't think anyone can know how people will respond to something. For me, it was it was an incredible experience and I absolutely loved, loved, loved the book. I absolutely loved, loved, loved the story. Um, I think in some ways I was lucky that I didn't know. You know, I just, I it was just so immediate. I thought it was gonna be a small European film that no one would see. Um, and so I just dove into this little bubble and had no expectations. <laughs> How many days were you actually on set? It was quite a small shooting schedule for you, was it? Well, it's interesting. It was such a short amount of screen time. I mean, just really two scenes. But I was there the whole summer. Um, there was a lot of prep. I think, I think that in some ways, films don't really get made like that that often um, anymore. There's such a pressure to kind of compartmentalize and move things quickly. But I was really there. I did a lot of... Um, makeup tests and costume tests with all the makeup artists and um, became really good friends with them actually. And then my teeth fell out and we had to make this crazy um, like giant like insert, this tooth insert and that took two weeks at the dentist. I mean, so I would say just prep for getting the character the way that Wolfgang wanted the Empress to look was at least a month and a half of just all kinds of makeup tests and costume tests and tooth making tests. <laughs> and then there was filming and then there was a little break and then I came back and filmed the second scene. So, I mean, it was three months of time budgeted to be in, in, in the Bavarian studios in Germany. So it's quite a long time actually. Did you have a chance to be around any of the other scenes that you weren't in being filmed? Like maybe watching the other actors, watching how everyone worked? I did, yeah. Um, I was really, really interested in the puppets. I was completely blown away by them. So I was always trying to sneak onto set and not be like, I'm not gonna say anything, I'm just gonna sit and watch. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and they were very nice. They really did let me uh, sit and watch quite a bit. So that was really fun. Do you remember one of the most memorable scenes that you saw? You didn't see the Artax dying scene, did you? I'm really glad that they didn't let me there because that wouldn't have been good. <laughs> you know, the good news is that I feel like there were all these crazy rumors that the horse died and it was like, you know, really traumatized by that. And, and it wasn't like that horse was trained to do that. It, they started with like a quarter of inch of mud, took it out, gave it a whole bunch of treats. Then it was an inch of mud, took it out, gave it a bunch of treats. So, you know, they really did spend a, a long process acclimating the horse to that. But I still think that it would have been hard to watch. I, I do remember watching um, Noah in the Swamps of Sadness getting blown off when Morla sneezes. And, there, you know, there's a, there's a stunt double and him. It was like a back and forth between the two of them. So that was like really fascinating to watch behind the scenes. And then just the Swamps of Sadness were incredible. They were real it was a, a a tent that went on it was like a city block it was so big it was insane it was like they brought so much mud to this huge canopy that was just you would stand in, like we walked into where they were filming and you turned around and you couldn't see the edges it was so massive so at the time i kind of thought well all movies are probably like this um in a way it's sort of wonderful to be a kid you kind of just take everything as it comes and and um it was really like being alice in wonderland you're just like what is happening and your scenes were actually really emotional scenes so as for someone so young did that come naturally did you did wolfgang have to really work with you on that how how did you kind of get into that emotion at the end I was a very hyper emotional child. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, to the point where I was, I think I was just annoying to everybody, you know, like a fly would die and I'd be like, Oh my God, it's life cycle is so short. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> sort of horrifically philosophical. I've been spending my lifetime like just trying to harden up and like normalize myself. It still doesn't really work, but I, I'm, 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 on, I'm still working on it. Um, so for me, to be honest with you, theater and, 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 and magic spaces and film spaces were such a relief such a relief to be able to express emotion and have it be useful, have it contribute to something, have it not be <laughs> sort of annoying. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I just, I felt so at home in a, in a world where there was space for emotions. And I, I found the world outside of the studio just really exhausting because I was constantly having to like, contain my emotions and you know not show them and it was like oh my god it's such a relief to you know be emotional i loved it and presumably it was that connection and um ability to go into these other worlds that drew you to dancing and was dancing always your first love and acting second or was it just um life that kind of took you to dancing how did that happen i would say that that i loved both of them equally. Um, I think in some ways, uh, getting into the film so young may have actually pushed me into dancing because it was such a, making the film was incredible and like a really positive experience. Navigating the aftermath of the film and just what it means to be famous for this like, short period of time and, and then Hollywood and, and sort of agents and directors. Like I found the sort of machine of the industry uh, really overwhelming. And I, I just told you I was a pretty emotional <laughs> I don't know that my personality was so suited. I was not savvy <laughs> at all, you know, it's like a very kind of open, naive person and child. And I think my parents were like, they're just going to chew her up. Like, what are we, how is this sort of creature going to handle that? This little butterfly. Yeah. So I think, you know, dance was just a, a, a very, a, it was a, an arena I loved equally and it just felt very um, uh, manageable in scale. You know, there just wasn't the, the, the scale of it was, it was just like a smaller scale. And, um, and then when I went to New York and I had my dance company for 20 years, um, I was in a position to direct, to produce, to raise the money, and, and everything was sort of in this scale that I had a really good handle on. And I think that it was really exciting to um, kind of be a generative artist. So you're, you're both bringing things to life, but you're also really the force behind what is the the story that you're telling. Um, but for me, I really missed, I missed acting. I was always sneaking into plays constantly. I was constantly sneaking into plays in New York, like between dance gigs. And, um, and I'm so excited to be coming back to acting. It is in some ways my first love. And my body is so, you know, like dance has a shelf life. The shelf has arrived. <laughs> That's a very gentle way to put it. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting, you know, it's kind of bittersweet to have to let go of this thing that was such a central part of who I was and for a long time, but it's like everything you close one door and it suddenly swings open another door. And I think, you know, I think it's really fun to come back to, to acting after such a long time, such a long time. <laughs> Um, and kind of uh, see, see what it gives me now and see what I can give to it. Um, so it's all, it's all kind of exciting and it's exploration. It's also terrifying, I'm not gonna lie. It's all, it's all of those things. Well, that's very exciting to hear that the, the plan is to kind of move back into acting because we have missed you. You're a huge part of our childhood. Um, never Ending Story, as we know, so many people grew up on the film, so many people, it means so much to them. What is a film that you grew up with that is like your never ending story? Well, I have like a, like a feel good one and then I have like the, the, the sort of more speculative one. I mean, I think Princess Bride is the perfect film. I do. I just think it's the perfect film. It's like, 
every once in a while a film is made where just you just like how how is it so perfect so i watch that every time i can i just love the sort of vaudevillian nature of it you know you can really feel this like old tradition of like that inside of this film and it, the way that those two worlds collide is ama amazing um and then and then i love blade runner i know that's a really really old film but for me just it's so ahead of its time in terms of thinking about where the world is going and I don't know, you know, we do, we have climate change, we have this whole crazy world where all the kids are looking at the adults and going, do I really have to listen to you? I mean, look at the state of the world, adults, like, what have you, are you sure you're in charge? You know, sometimes um, I just, I, I feel like we are sort of crazily mismanaging our resources and and being in Scotland especially and looking at the natural world and how magical it is just the I was in New York City for so long and I forgot I just forgot how incredible uh nature is and 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 visiting the same beach every morning and just seeing it change every day um it's really it's really special. So Blade Runner is that world. It's like that thing where we just killed all the animals and now they're robots. And, um, and you, you know, I just think it was incredibly made and the visuals of it are incredible. And then just this, this, um, this question about, you know, how we take care of the world around us to the point where we destroy it. And then also, you know, our humanity, how we extend it and who we extend it to, like all of those questions feel kind of timeless to me and and ones that we're still really chewing on as a as a culture and also it seemed to me it set up the way films always portrayed the future like every film since blade runner it always had those like hologram ads and the you know it just it it was kind of like every film became its own blade runner copying that style very influential what did you think of the latest blade runner props to them i think they did a great job it's you're never gonna replace the original you just can't like you just can't it's like i liked it a lot i i thought it was good but i mean the original i'm showing my age it's like one of those like old people in a car who's like the what? musical must never be as good as when i was seen. you know so i have that i have that nostalgic thing for the original <laughs> Hey, I hear you. I get it. You know, I think there's something really special about the the nostalgia and I don't think you can be the original. I mean, I thought Never Ending Story 2 and 3, I don't feel like people acknowledge them. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think the original will always be the best. Um, is it true that your mum didn't want you to be in any sequels for that? Yes, yes. My, my mother was uh, particularly, I mean, maybe even too much so you know i think um she was very very nervous about the sort of psychological aspects and the sort of what the hollywood machine would do to me um it's a, it's a, one of those you know now as a mother i have a nine-year-old and it's a really interesting question like how how much how much do you protect your kid how much do you expose them to challenges i mean and you'll never get it right. <laughs> you know, Wise words. But yeah, she, she was very, more, more so than my father, she was particularly worried about it. Um, and it's also one of those things where she, she would have hated it. You know, she would have absolutely hated having to be a public figure. My mother was not at all interested in that. Um, I'm much more extroverted. I love meeting people. I love exchanging stories. So, you know, I think there's a side of my personality that actually um, does get a lot out of the opportunity that being an artist gives you to interface with people in a slightly deeper way. I really like that. I mean, it's also why I like being a teacher. Like, there's only so much you can get out of an exchange with someone where like, hi, how are you? How's the weather? How's the coffee? And you really don't, <laughs> you really don't learn who that person is, you know. But then, for example, at Comic-Cons, like there are these people that will come and they'll say, you know, the never ending story 
inspired me to become a photographer and everyone in my family did something else and I came from a long line of something else and I dreamed of doing this crazy thing and everyone told me that it was insane and I looked at this movie and I was just like I'm gonna try it and there's this brief moment where you exchange a kind of um, a moment with someone that's actually kind of profound that's uh, like a window into this really critical part of who they became. And for me, that's, that's what art can do. It can kind of be a window where we, we exchange something of ourselves with others. That's just, just a, a level deeper than what goes on in regular life. And then those exchanges after the fact about how a film or a story or a book or uh, you know impacted you it's 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 that sort of it's it's connected to that sort of deeper exchange and i don't know it's all about connection right like that's what we're all searching for and for, for me stories are are my way into that i mean sadly obviously 2020 has impacted so much uh, we i met you for the first time in liverpool at the beginning of this year i have to say i was so nervous and i tried not to let it show but i was so nervous meeting you, you did a great job you didn't seem nervous I at good. All. i was really hiding it so a lot of comic cons were cancelled this year do you have any plans coming up where people can meet you at comic cons or events oh gosh i feel so bad for the for that whole industry and it it was you know it was really like a wonderful kind of way for people to kind of just dress up and dive into a little bit of magic so i it's really tragic what COVID has done to that whole thing uh i mean all the comic cons that i was registered for are being rescheduled for you know for like the following year i think i'm scheduled to be at one in the u.s you can go to my website if you're interested in that um so i think that some of those are starting up starting in march i have them on my calendar um, and then there was one supposed to be in Scotland last summer, and I guess I'll be here. <laughs> so anyone that wanted to, well, anyone watching now, young kid, adult, who wants to be an actor, who wants to do what you're doing, whether it's maybe on screen or writing or directing or dancing, what advice would you give them if they are wanting to set out on that journey? You just have to do it. You just have to do it. The only way to, to do something is to do it. And um, I think that, you know, uh, there's a million reasons why you can talk yourself out of it or um, that it's going to be hard. And I think it just really comes down to like, you know, do you have to do it? <laughs> it's not a very easy road, I, I think, to be an artist. It's, it's really hard. Like, you really need to be prepared to meet larger obstacles, I think, than maybe you typically would if you were uh, gonna choose a slightly more organized, less haphazard road. And if a less, and if you're really interested in something that has maybe a more straightforward path, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I think you should do that. <laughs> but if you just can't, I mean, it's sort of like telling my dog to be a cat. You know, I have my little dog here. Like, my dog's a dog, you know? Like, it just can't be anything other than a dog. And I think that's something that some people who, who kind of aren't kind of magnetically drawn to being artists don't fully understand. It's like, you just can't be anything Yeah, you can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, so you kind of just have to do it. And then... You know, there's times that are easier and then there's times that are harder and then you just have to be spiritual about it and be like, what can I learn from this dry spell and what can I, how can I give back in the spell that's, you know, uh, lusher and, but I just think, you know, if you have to do it, then you have to do it and then you don't apologize for who you need to be, you just go be that person. Wise words, I completely agree. Um, thank you so much for your time. I won't keep you any longer because I know that you're an incredibly busy woman. Um, I just so grateful for you giving your time for the web show today and so excited to come and see you again in person, wherever that may be. No, it was a pleasure to be here. I am, um, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm so grateful for Zoom. It lets me connect and communicate and, you know, I, in this, in my, little fishing village in Scotland. It's such a pleasure to have you <laughs> to talk to you. So thanks for, thanks for visiting me. <laughs> Loved 
chatting to Tammy, just so amazing. Um, obviously, Life After Atreyu is the next in the series, so we will, of course, be interviewing Tammy for that. I mean, how many times can I say I'm so excited? Yes, we are doing a never ending story documentary. Ugh, we started filming before lockdown, and unfortunately, we had to stop because of that, but we are coming back, and we're coming back strong. Yes, so, but in the meantime, we were able to finish Life After the Navigator. Now, how could I, if I was interested in winning that disc and patch, how would I go? Well, first of all, what is in it? Well, let me, good, because it gives me time to think of what the question should be. Um, region free, not flea, That's free. Good. Over 70 minutes of bonus features on this bad boy as well. Or girl, bad girl, you know, PC. Um, including a short film that Joe, Joe Kramer did in 1988, which is pretty awesome uh, to see. There's like other interviews and stuff and deleted scenes, extended scenes. Not only that, you also mm. get a 12 page. Count them. 12, can I get that, can I get a recount 12 please? page collector's yep, 12. booklet. Great for signings, go to Comic Cons. All designed by our dear friend Bob, Li Bob Bob Lindenmeyer, I can't speak today. Um, Bob did the poster, Bob did the opening title. We love you, he Bob. All this artwork. He also did all the artwork on Flash too. So, whoops. And the title so, sequence for the movie. So talented. So, uh, region free, great bonus features available now from lifeaftermovies.com. You can also buy Life After Flash on there. It's competition. What is the question for the competition? We'll be drawing this in our next show. You have to, of course, subscribe to the channel and comment below what is your favourite scene in Flight of the Navigator and why. And we like good answers, people. We Thank like you. answers that have got some thought behind them, so make sure it's a good one. So the winner, just to recap, signed copy. This isn't signed because they're currently being shipped to Joe to sign, but it'll be a signed copy of Life After the Navigator, signed by Joey Kramer and a crew patch. Pretty awesome. So subscribe and comment below your favorite scene from Flight of the Navigator and why. Also comment who else would you like us to talk to on the web show? Yep, and we will we'll endeavor to go out there and get hold of them. Yes, what did you think of the interview with Tammy? Are you gonna go and come and see Tammy or Noah or Joe at any of the Comic Cons next year? What other life after films would you like us to make? That is a good question. We've got our list that we're working our way through. Are there any end and why as well? Be interested to hear. I know we do have a few bubbling that we're not announcing yet, but life after a tray, you ah, I can't wait. Um, thank you as always for watching. Thank you, Tammy, for being amazing. All Tammy's social media, I mean, you probably follow anyway, but just in case, all social media is down below as well. Um, and yeah. I guess- you we'll know. be back soon, so stay tuned, click that bell, and then it will let you know when we're back with more fantastic content. Yes, uh, enjoy lockdown if you happen to be in a country with a lockdown at the moment. If you're not locked down... Go and have a drink for us in a pub. Yes. I remember the pub. Oh, I remember the pub. Oh, those were the he days. said wistfully. <laughs> um, but until, well, the, till the next episode, we'll have a fabulous day, week, not month, month. whatever. <laughs> Hmm.